Hello, this is Jason Kendall, and welcome to the next of my introductory astronomy lectures. We're going to finish off the basics of telescopes this time, and we're going to talk about some of the aspects of things that you probably do know or might not know about the nature of what a telescope is and does. Well, first, let's go with the more, more interesting things that you see. Let's say you go to an amateur observing telescope party and you look through a telescope and you see the moon in the sky and it might be a crescent moon. But in the telescope, its, revert, its image is inverted so that the crescent faces the other direction. And the crater seem to be upside down too. Well, that's because a telescope will invert an image and flip it as it, goes, as it passes through the light path. Now, another one way to think about that is the light comes from the moon, let's say, and goes into a lens, say, of a refractor. It goes into the refractor's lens, it goes to a focus, then it starts to broaden out again from the focus, meaning the upper light, the light from the top of the moon, gets swapped with the light from the bottom of the moon. Then as it starts to diverge again, you put a magnification eyepiece right there so that it, it, it sends it to your eye. So the magnification uh, is you have a magnifying eyepiece and then the inverted light, then, well, mostly it's because as the light comes through, it gets inverted and then the, magnific then the eyepiece then rectifies it and focuses it into your eye. So all telescopes that we look at invert the view. In fact, your eye as a lens inverts the view, but your brain then re-inverts those views so that you see the world uh, right side up rather than upside down but your eye as a lens actually flips the view of the world because that's just what lenses do. So when it comes to a mirror though, the mirror image then, uh, it, when you have a mirror image, you have to rectify that as well. Mostly you just figure out which way is up and which way is down, which way is north, east, and south on the plate, and then you can fix that in Adobe Photoshop later or using IRAF or some other, or a Python IRAF or PyRAF or something to, in order to deal with the actual orientation of the image after the fact. But that's why when you look at a telescope, you always see it upside down and backwards, and that's because of the path of the light through the telescope changes the orientation. All right, but more important than the orientation is a characteristic of a telescope called the focal ratio. The focal ratio is a primary characteristic of every telescope's de design. It's defined to be the focal length of the objective, or primary, divided by the diameter of the focal length of the, of the diameter of the, of the primary or objective. So that's called the focal ratio, the focal length divided by the diameter. Now, one of my telescopes that I own has an 85 millimeter diameter and has a focal length of 600 millimeters, and so I'll call that a focal ratio of seven, or an F7 telescope. And that's just a little refractor I have, and I really like it. But the focal ratio is also can be called the speed of the telescope. So the smaller the F number, what they call F slash, when you see that diagram, when you see it on a telescope, what's the focal ratio or what's the F number? The focal ratio, the F number, the smaller the focal ratio number, the lower the magnification, the wider the field of view, and the brighter the image is with any given eyepiece or camera. So a short, short focal ratio are good for wide, or good for observing wide fields of view and deep space photography, deep space astrophotography. But if you have a slow focal length, meaning the look, typically a slow focal ratio means the focal length is very long. And those are usually better suited to high power uh, lunar or planetary observing and binary observing where you want to get high powers. So, if you want to do something in the middle, like say an F5 system, or just comparing two systems, if you combine, compare an F5 system to an F10 system, what that means is that uh, for a given diameter, if it's the same diameter, or even a different diameter, the focal image will be, uh, essentially, you'll be able to, for a, for a given F5 system, will be able to image or an extended object, specifically an extended object like a nebula, in a much quicker rate time, about a quarter of the time, but it will only be half as large an image at your detector. It's an interesting thing to have. So point sources, though, like stars, they don't really care about that. That's it's primarily, it's only we're only caring right now at this moment to extended objects. But point sources, like stars, they care more about the aperture because you're just trying to collect photons from a point source. But for a focal ratio, that's what we're talking about, getting spread out, getting brighter or dimmer. And that's what we call the plate scale. 
So the focal length of an object determines its plate scale. The plate scale says how big is your image at the prime focus. When you focus all your light at that place, so the light goes through the lens, it gets focused down to a point, how big is the image at that place? It started this big, how big is it now at that point? So we'd have to say that the image is smaller in area than the, than the, the object collecting the light. Here comes the big, it comes in and hits a big mirror, and then it gets reduced down in size in terms of actual areas, in terms of physical area, to a little bitty tiny thing. The longer the focal length it is, the bigger the physical separation of points are on the detector. So that's kind of a weird way of thinking about it. But that's kind of what you want. So let's say you want to image Saturn's rings and get all sorts of beautiful things and beautiful details. Then you want a large physical separation of the individual ring diameters, like the Cassini division, on the detector so you can make them out. So you want a very long focal length in order to get a large physical separation. And what do we mean by physical separation? We're not talking about the rings of Saturn themselves. We're talking about physical separation of points of light or sources of light on the detector. Because remember, your detector is a physical thing. It is like a, it's a camera. The camera has some sort of detector on it. So as the light comes through the detector, it focuses it down to a physical location. You put your image detector at that physical location. So you're gonna have a larger physical separation, but you're gonna have a smaller image. You're gonna see less of the object, but everything you have on the detector will be spread apart bigger. That's a good way of thinking about it. Um, another way of thinking about it is if you have a really, 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 really long focal length, it's like having looking down a tube with no lens, right? So you're just saying, oh, I want the whole thing, but then the, but then the detector then looks at a specific little area. All right, another way of looking at it is the plate scale can be measured in terms of arc seconds of the sky per millimeter of the detector. That's another way of looking at it. So you're going to say how many arc seconds are there present on this diameter of the, of the detector, per millimeter of detector. Your detector could be this big or this big or that big or this big. We want to know per millimeter on the detector how many arc seconds there are. And that's called the plate scale. It's dependent on the focal length. So the plate scale, you get more arc seconds per millimeter with a longer focal length. And uh, with, with, you get, well, you get with a shorter focal length. The shorter the focal length, the more arc seconds you get per millimeter. That makes a big field. So if you want to really zoom in, you want to get a high magnification, then you want to have a long focal length, which gives a shorter plate scale. All right, so the other thing that that kind of leads to is the concept of magnification. Now, when you go to a junk store and you want to find, you go into like some, some discount department store and they've got over here in the children's section a telescope made by cheapotelescopes.com. Cheapotelescopes.com will have a big thing on the box that says, well, this is a 100 magnification telescope. Never buy a telescope based on magnification because magnification is the least important thing. The focal ratio is important, the aperture is important, whether or not it's got a steady tripod is really important, whether or not it's actually got you know, steel eyepieces or plastic eyepieces, that's more important. Never go by a telescope by the hundred times magnification on a box in something in a store somewhere. I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but hey, you gotta tell somebody and somebody's gonna see this and you can say, I ah, don't bother with that, go actually look for a real telescope. But what actually is magnification? Magnification is the apparent change in angular size that you see an object to be because of the effect of the eyepiece. So the magnification is the focal length of the objective divided by the focal length of the eyepiece. So if you have a primary length, like in this example, we could say that the focal length of the, of the primary is about 60 centimeters and the focal length of the eyepiece maybe is 3.7 millimeters, then you're gonna have a magnification of 161 times. So if you have a really, 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 really short eyepiece, magnification, uh, really, really short eyepiece focal length, then the magnification is gonna blow up and be really big for a given objective, for a given uh, focal length of an objective. 
Um, most people, most telescope makers would say, don't bother with a magnification greater than 200 because as you magnify, you spread the light out over a larger and larger area. So therefore the image gets dimmer and dimmer. So higher magnification means a dimmer look at the thing. It doesn't make it brighter, it makes it dimmer to your eye. If you wanna make it bright, make low magnification. That makes it very bright. The greater the magnification, the dimmer it is because you're taking that and spreading the light instead of having it into a little area, it's spreading out into a large area. So it's an interesting way of putting at it. And the more, as you're buying telescopes, look at magnification last, I mean dead last. In fact, don't even bother considering it. You want to care to the, the quality of manufacture and the diameter of the telescope and the focal ratio. That's the things you care about. And maybe even what you want to do. You want to look at the planets, you want to look at deep space. But typically there's always a balanced sort of thing, a middle, a middle road focal ratio that'll get you there. And those things are for another day of talking about it. All right, so what kind of telescopes do we have out there on the market that exist in the world? Well, modern research grade telescopes and large purpose telescopes are all reflectors. There are no major uh, research grade refractors left because that's a big piece of glass. And a big piece of glass, let's say you have a, two fo a three foot diameter piece of glass. Now, that's gonna have a long focal length. So that means you're gonna put this in a very, very, very long telescope. And a long telescope has a big lever arm, which means that the telescope itself would weigh an enormous amount just to support the glass. And then the glass has to be supported at the edges, not in the middle. So you have only one edge to support it. Also, the, light, the lens has to be really perfect. So as you look at it, you go, wow, this is kind of a crazy thing. If I'm gonna make, I get some really nice views with a refractor, which is true. You can get some extraordinary views with a refractor, but it's not gonna be a research quality because you need to have something bigger, you need to have brighter, and you need to have higher resolution. And that means a reflecting telescope. So, the reason that you don't use opti uh, refractors uh, for research is that you gotta have really perfect glass, you have to have a really perfect surface, and it has to be supported in ways that are really difficult and extremely expensive to do. So elementary reflecting telescopes, there's lots of different kinds of reflecting telescopes, so the basic is you've got a mirror, and then you put something, you figure out a way to put an, your detector at the prime focus or at the focal length. The problem with refractor reflectors is, of course, you gotta put something in the path of the light. So you get diffraction, not just from the telescope, but diffraction around the thing that you put to get to gather the light with. So a Newtonian telescope, which is a standard thing you'll find uh, for sale from lots of different telescope makers, you put a secondary mirror that's held by some struts and that sends it out the side of the tube, and then you put an eyepiece there. All right, so now you've got diffraction, not just from the blocking of the mirror, but from the struts that hold the little secondary mirror in place. Yeah, and people that really like to do very high quality imaging, they try to use refractors, but they're small refractors. But people that want to do deep sky observing use reflectors, and there's, you just deal with the diffraction problems of the reflector. Um, so you have your two basic types. You have reflecting telescopes and refracting telescopes. But there's lots of ways you can actually do reflecting telescopes. The first one is called prime focus. So you have a big, big, big telescope and you put your detector exactly where the light gets focused. And that means you put a cage there, you put your detector there and you swing the whole thing around. But the prime focus, you better have a really solid tube for the telescope because you're gonna have, or some sort of structure for the telescope because you're gonna put your detector right at the prime focus. And sometimes in some telescopes, you might find even a cage where people would sit inside the prime focal chamber and ride the telescope for the evening. That makes for an interesting evening. And there's, of course, the Newtonian focus, which was developed by Sir Isaac Newton, which is a little secondary mirror popped out to the side. And another one is called the Cassegrain focus, where you're going to be blocking the light anyway, so why not just cut a hole in the mirror, make a circular hole in the mirror behind, directly behind the secondary mirror, now the secondary mirror then, you make it have a little bit of a curve to it so that extends the focal length of, of it so it makes a larger image or a better plate scale. So the Cassegrain mirror allows you to put a detector right behind the mirror, which is a good place in terms of weight. It's a fantastic place in terms of weight. It allows you to balance a telescope and make a really stubby telescope into a longer telescope. A third thing that you'll find 
which is much more common at research grade telescopes, is called a Naismith Coudé focus. And there's a secondary mirror and then a tertiary mirror behind the secondary that sends it out along the axis of the telescope's mount. So the telescope will be mounted in a fork or something, and inside the fork mount is the perfect balance point. And then you make a hole in the, in the fork, and you send your light out that hole, which is in the balance point of the yoke of the telescope that's holding it all up. And that's called a Naismith or Coudet focus. So that particular kind of focus is incredibly useful because now you, you don't have the, absurd, you don't have the uh, instrument riding the back of the mirror, it's off to the side. It can be set up on some sort of platform off to the side and you just rotate the telescope and rotate the thing and it just stays put. So this is the best way because now the telescope only has to do pointing and, or, and that's all it cares about. You don't have all this extra weight and that's a, the Naismith Coudet focus is a very common thing for major research telescopes. So next time, I'll show you some of those major research telescopes. I've only been to one in that area and a couple of others and have helped work on one way a long time ago. But we'll look at the different kinds of major astronomical observatories next time. See you soon.